Todd Richards here, Roots Hearts. And Soul. Stefan and I are launching this podcast based off cookbook Roots Heart and Soul by myself, Todd Richards, with a great help from Chef Stefan, the man, the myth, the legend himself. Oh, you stop, you. We have such a beautiful history together. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Really, what people are going to get from this podcast is telling the story of of Afro people, Afro cuisine. We're going to be telling the story of the Pan-African diaspora. Roots, heart, soul of the of the world, as we say. We are we launching in a couple of weeks here. Some terrific guests. Stay tuned. Follow us on all our social media at Chef Todd Richards in all formats. Chef Stefan, what's yours? Chef Stefan dot i t a y i t i. This is the correct way to say Haiti. Well, we're getting education already. So if you want to find out more, if you want to listen to great stories being told by amazing, amazing culinary talents, we're going to be hearing stories from Africa all the way to the Caribbean, all the way to the Americas. It's going to be it's going to be something special. Giving everyone a good rhythm, the good vibes. Yeah, baby. We look forward to seeing everyone. Talk soon. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Since 2009, HRN podcasts have been exploring the wide world of food, beverage, and agriculture. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. Westholm is working with the land to create nature-led Australian Wagyu. Westholm believes that when nature leads, flavor follows. Learn more at westholm.com. We talk about food. We talk about music. Hello and welcome to Snacky Tunes. I'm your host, Darren Bresnitz. Today we sit down with food writer and cookbook author Kushbu Shah, whose new book, Omri Khan, is a love letter to the culinary traditions of the Indian American diaspora. We talk about how immigration shapes food cultures, how her parents adapted their pantry, and some of the delicious recipes that you can find in the book. And then we dip into the archives for a chat and performance from Ani Rossi, a singer, violinist, and keyboardist from Minnesota. She swung by to share some sounds from her uniquely constructed instruments, as well her release that came out that spring. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy Snacky Tunes here on HRN.
Ushbu, welcome to Snacky Tunes. I know you are on a national, international <laughs> march around the world celebrating your book, Amri Khan. So congratulations. The initial response has been amazing. What's it like for this book to be on yeah. the world, sharing it with others? It's a little wild, you know, when something has been in your own sort of personal bubble for two and a half years and then it sort of sure. leaves the group. You know, like it all feels a little strange. Yeah. <laughs> but it's very cool. It's been really fun to, yeah, fun to have it out in the world. Yeah. I mean, it's just so nice. And I think what's really great about this book, and I can only speak from my personal experience, um, you know, I know about the Jewish diaspora from Europe mm-hmm. in like the 40s and 50s. I don't know as much about the Indian American diaspora. And I think before we get into our chat, can you set the stage a little bit about like the context and you do a really good job in the book about the different decades and how that actually influenced the restaurants, but give a broader sense of the Indian American diaspora and, and yeah. how, how it relates to, to your world. Definitely. The Indian American diaspora is one of the younger diasporas um, in America, you know, it mm. really started like there, there, obviously there were a handful of Indians you know, kind of pre-1965 Immigration Act. But once that act was signed, it really opened up um, the doors to immigration, especially for people pursuing higher education. So this is where you sort of get the the trope that like all Indians are like doctors and lawyers and scientists sure, sure, sure. and engineers because they like literally are um, because everyone coming, you know, that are kind of able to get, especially the H-1B visas are mm-hmm, all tied mm-hmm. to doing either, you know, higher education or, you know, kind of like engineering, like, like white collar um, science jobs. Um, and so this really sort of shapes, um, you know, what Indian food really looks like in America, you know, right, I think right. they, of Indian food via India or via Britain. But, you know, the British relationship with India is much longer than the American relationship. Yeah. And immigration A little bit more complicated. Has- a little more complicated, um, you know, and immigration has been happening for a much longer time uh, also. And, you know, you get a, a real mix of white collar, blue collar, you know, across the board. But in America, it's um, a little more, um, you know, it's a, it's a little more specific, the, the type of immigration that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and obviously it's been happening for a while. And, and I mean, I feel like I grew up eating Indian food and so it's not new to me, mm-hmm. but it is relatively new to a larger part of the country, more so than, let's say, Mexican food or Chinese food or things like that. Why did you feel that this was the right time to write this book, culturally or personally, this moment? Yeah. You know, I feel like there's been in not like, you know, Indian food has been around for a few decades now. Um, and as like, I used to be the restaurant editor at Food and Wine Magazine. And so a large mm-hmm. part of that job was just doing like loops around the country, you know, finding all the best new restaurants and all the best new chefs. But as part of that, like I had a really great uh, like view of like what Indian food was really looking like across the entire country also, you know, like what it looks like in Texas versus what it looks like in New York, or, you know, versus what it looks like in Chicago. Um, but it became very clear to me that there was just like a, a real unique identity of Indian food in America that is very different than, you know, via England, via India. Um, and it was something that people, I think, just didn't really realize was, like, happening. Um, but it was happening. Mm. Uh, I wanted to just, like, really put a spotlight on it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I think now that you've been around the country and you have the book out, you've talked to a lot of people – what do you think America's understanding of Indian yeah. food is these days? <laughs> you know, it's still, it's, it's still not as, um, uh, as wide ranging as I might hope. Uh, you know, mm. it's still a lot of, you know, most people kind of know butter chicken, you know, maybe if you're lucky, they know samosa, garlic, naan, a lassi maybe, you know, and then also what's really interesting is kind of that, sort of health space has kind of also opened up a lot of Indian culture. So, you know, people are really familiar with like chai and like yoga and turmeric and and kichari, but like they, you know, they call it kichari and they kind of bastardize it all. Um, And it's so, it's so interesting, you know, this kind of Ayurvedic wellness entry, like entry point um, into Indian culture too. Um, 
But, you know, there's still a lot of education to be done, but there's still, you know, but there's also a lot of progress. Like, listen, the Trader Joe's, like, Indian food selection is actually yeah. kind of impressive. You know, and I feel like it's gotten a lot of people to try a lot of things. And like, you know, you go to Costco these days and Whole Foods these days and you can get like paneer and, you know, different Indian ingredients. You know, it's way easier to source, um, which is really cool to see. So there's a lot of progress to be made, but, you know, it's it's not um, as dire as it once was. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you can get garam masala in yeah. ralph's these Target. days and yeah, you know exactly. you can get a lot a lot of spices like that um yeah so the title of the book i'm um, can i i liked it because i never heard it before um uh, and it was like your catch-all to describe all things american and so i i get it's close and sounding in, in many ways yeah. but I would love to hear maybe the origin and some of your favorite examples of how you or your friends or family use this term. Yeah. So American is how Indians say American, especially like Indians, like from India, they'll be like, Oh, you're so American or like, you know, they're from America. Um, and I wanted to use this spelling in particular though, because I think it just makes people kind of like double take, you know, for a second, cause it almost looks like America, but it's not quite America as you like. I will say it. when I first picked up yeah. the book, I was like, oh, there's I was like, oh, I get the spelling of, of American here. And then I, I opened yeah. the book and actually read. And I was like, no, I was wrong. I was absolutely wrong. <laughs> and the SEO was better um, for this. A hundred percent. A hundred percent SEO better. So yeah. Amazon hates the spelling and automatically correct. If you put my book into Amazon, it'll just bring up American flags first. And then sure. you have to like, of course, which is what you want. It. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It takes two, two clicks to get to the book, but you do get there eventually. Um, and so, you know, it was kind of like the joke title, like that I had on my proposal because I just needed a title and, and it ended up being the one that stuck because anytime I would sort of bring it up to anybody, like in the culture, there was it would automatically like elicit kind of like a chuckle. They'd be like, "Ha ha!" You yeah. know, like everyone's like, "Oh!" Like everyone kind of got it. And I was like, "Okay, yeah." You know, I couldn't think of like a one word, two word title that sort of summarized the approach of the book or like what the book was really trying to say or do better than American. You know, it's America with like a Desi Indian like accent. You know, essentially, and that's what the food is in this book. Yeah, I mean, I I absolutely love it. Um, you know. There is always this push and pull of like trying to preserve tradition and heritage. And I'm, I'll call it like one and a half generation, you know, <laughs> sort of second generation. But I found that, you know, obviously grandparents want to really preserve it. Mm-hmm. Um, my parents preserved it, but were like expanding more American. And then I found like our generation is now looking backwards to be like, what is it all? mean to be nowhere we come from but in american yeah um mm-hmm. uh how did you find that in your research you know how did you find that balance did you find there was a struggle ex- you know when you were putting yeah, these recipes I, together I mean, and things like that what's interesting is like you're right like our parents generation like especially you know when i was doing research for this book it was all about survival for them right so it's more about like trying to survive in this new country, kind of the most comfortable, like in the most comfortable way possible. So it's like, you know, they're trying to make things as familiar as they can with things that are incredibly unfamiliar to them. Um, and so that's why you get a lot of these kind of like auntie hacks, you know, in this, in, mm. in this book have figured out how to use Bisquick and tortillas, you know, and peanut butter to make Indian food, you know, apple butter to make tamarind chutney um, because like they're searching for familiarity, but like, through unfamiliar ingredients, you know, so they're not really worried about quote unquote authenticity or, you know, staying true to like, you know, the historical way of like making something. They just want things that they feel comfortable eating um, that remind them, you know, of home or are, you know, of the the way that they like to eat um, in a, in a place that didn't necessarily always provide that or doesn't make it the easiest to find um, versus I feel like our, generation you know tends to be a little bit more concerned with like preserving not necessarily like authenticity but like tricky word we all know that that word is yeah, maybe preserving, like tradition you know yeah. i think is 
would be maybe like a better way to phrase it. Or, you know, I think for a lot of people, especially in our generation, like what's really interesting, and this is why I think I'm so obsessed with like, you know, food culture and food writing. And, and it's always been the draw for me is to like why I do this as a profession is because like food is often the final bridge that people have to their cultures, like the one that sort of like lasts or it's Mm -hmm. the first bridge that you can build back, you know, like, and I think that's also really interesting. Like, even if you feel really separated from it, like food is the one bridge that you can really build quite quickly, you know, back into a culture. Um, And there's something really, really beautiful about that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so beautiful. And, you know, my, my grandmother on my father's side, who was a chef, um, I mean, you know, incredible for, for what mm-hmm. she, for her home stuff. I'm, you know, she's from Hungary and, and I remember traveling back to like that part of the country, Eastern Europe and, and eating it, that food. And yeah. I'd never been, um, I think I was in Poland. So not exactly apples to apples, but I was like, oh my God, here's the dill and the cream and the flavors and things like that. I, I, I think people who, who haven't immigrated to America don't really know how tough it can be to sometimes to find your toehold. And like what yeah. a meal or a restaurant can really do to feel like you belong a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. Especially when you end up like settling kind of outside of these major metropolises, right? Like, oh, yeah. I grew up in deeply suburban Michigan, you know, where like perhaps had I grown up in Chicago, you know, it would have been a little bit different. Or, you know, I had friends that grew up in like Cerritos, you know, you know, in L.A., like, and they went to high school with mostly other Indians, you know. But like in for me, like growing up in mid-Michigan, there was, you know, six other Indians in my grade and there was 200 people in my class, you know. So, um, yeah, food was like the real the real comfort zone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Let's take a quick musical break. Uh, when we come back, I want to talk about the adaptation that your parents went through and learning how to cook and how um, some of this food has gone out of the kitchens and into restaurants today. We have a song from the archives here on Snacky Tunes on HRN.
Welcome back to Snacky Tunes. We are here with Kushbu Shah, whose new book, Umri Khan, focuses on the Indian American diaspora. And one of the other things that people who don't come from an immigrant family fail to realize is how much adaptation goes into these recipes and how sometimes those adaptations stick and then they become normalized. And you write about yeah. your parents coming over in the 70s and it's not like it is today, right? It's not mm-hmm. like if I want a certain spice, I can get it. I might yes. have to buy five pounds of it and it might take a couple of weeks, <laughs> but I can get a spice. I can get anything yeah. from anywhere in the world pretty much. That wasn't the case. And we're talking about staples, even specific type of flowers when you're baking. So how did your, your mother adapt in the 70s and how did that transform some of the more traditional recipes? And also, how did that remove some of the regionality of those traditional recipes? Yeah, that's really, I mean, it's interesting. Um, I feel like there's like some sort of auntie whisper network. I don't know how they all communicated. This is like <laughs> pre-WhatsApp, you know, pre-Facebook groups, like pre-TikTok, pre-internet, really, right? Like when you're talking about, you know, especially the 70s and the 80s. Um, when my parents came over. Um, and so, you know, they all sort of figured out the same kind of hacks somehow, but it's like, you know, gulab jamun, like sort of the beloved, you know, like deep fried, like donut and syrup Indian dessert that you can get at every restaurant, you know, that is like in most, like nine, I would I'll venture to say like out of a hundred households, 99 of them are making the, making it with Bisquick <laughs> sure. and like milk powder, you know, at this point in, you know, especially in America, like that is just like standard um, at this point, which is like kind of amazing. I don't know which auntie figured out like that, that was the, you know, the solution, um, but they're a goddamn genius for like, for doing it. Uh, you know, same goes for like, upma, which is this like really creamy, like porridgey type dish, um, really popular for like breakfast or like an easy lunch, you know, type situation. But if you couldn't find the suji or the semolina um, <laughs> that you need for it, yeah. you would just use cream of wheat, you know, which is was way easier to find, um, you know, in American grocery stores, especially a couple of decades ago than maybe perhaps today. So, uh, you know, a lot of those adaptations were just really you know, it's like now pretty standard or like it's just how the recipes are made. There's like a a chave dough, you know, in my book, chave dough is like an Indian snack mix, you know, it's yeah, like yeah. sweet, spicy, crunchy, salty. There's so many different ways of making chave dough. Um, but, you know, it's very standard in American households, like Indian American households to have a version made from breakfast cereal, cornflakes being like the baseline sure. of it. My mom kind of always took it to a next level, mixing together whatever cereals were sort of left over in the pantry. So, you know, Fruit Loops and things like that make an appearance in it, which is like so funny to, you know, when you really think about it. Um, But it's like super delicious and it's like really commonplace now, you know, like a cornflake chave dough is like a very standard Indian American like snack. You know, most households will have a version. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting because my, you know, my grandma all of a sudden – Canadian ginger ale was in the the recipe, and Kellogg's cornflakes was now the breading for her fried chicken. And uh-huh. it's like when you go back or you have something more traditional, you're like, yeah. "This isn't this isn't exactly what I thought uh, of what it was." But that's what I love about the book because you also have a grandma disclaimer that is like, "Hey, <laughs> yeah. hey, 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 we all have grandmas who did it a certain way, and that's probably your food food memory of this stuff." Do right. not hold my feet to the fire. Uh, yeah. <laughs> do not, do not, you know, do not come at me because your grandma does it a certain way. But I think it's smart yeah. to have. Especially, I think it's smart to have, especially when you're adapting so much, and especially back in the 70s and 80s, the regionality of what you can get in one supermarket versus another was, mm-hmm. people just don't understand it now. Yeah. And it was like, I mean, even, yeah, even, even more limited back then, you know, especially when it came to Indian food. Yeah. I don't know. You know, people are very, when it comes to cultural food, like people very much Mm -hmm. believe that their family's version is like the version. And it's like, no, there's so many versions of this. And like, not to say that, you know, their family's version is not an amazing version. It probably is. You know, I just encourage everybody to write it down and write your own book, you know, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, this is my take on it. You know, I, yeah, I think exactly. um, the flip side of it, though, and I know we talked a little bit about people becoming more familiar with it, uh, with Indian mm-hmm. food. 
But in general, you know, seeing things like Calusians or other spice-driven yeah. stores has yeah. um, allowed people to actually now get the real original ingredients as they were intended. How have you seen that old adaptation mixed with like the new availability? Have people, I know you mentioned there's still the cornflake stuff, but some people are like, okay, now I can get these real spices. Now I can make my own mixture. Have you seen people now go more to like being able to get back to the traditional recipes? I think it's a mix of stuff where I think it also means it's just like upping the quality of what sort of what you are sort of making, you know, like now it's so much easier to find like fresh curry leaves. And so maybe oh, yeah. historically you would have left it out before. Right. But the recipe is like so much better with it. And so now, you know, people are making sure that they're cooking mm. egg curry, the Carolyn style egg curry with, you know, all the curry leaves that they want, you know, everyone has the plant now, you know, it's much easier to buy like a curry leaf plant um, than it ever has been before. And so, you know, <laughs> never been cool. easier. Yeah, or recipes are evolving with some of these more traditional ingredients that weren't available before. Like I have a tarka focaccia in my book. You know, a tarka is like a cooking method, a uh, cooking technique in Indian food where you temper spices essentially in a hot fat and it like blooms the spices. Um, and you can temper a lot of different things, mustard seeds, sesame seeds, or dal, curry leaves, like, you know, whole dried peppers and um, whole dried chili peppers. And so I take that tarka of curry leaves, et cetera. And then I, you know, mix it into like a focaccia dough, you know, and like, mm. um, that's kind of my version of adaptation, you know, this kind of like 2.0, 3.0, it's not out of survival. It's more out of homage. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I love that. And and I love that. It's like, we had this, it evolved to this. Now I can have access to all of it. And so I can make it my yes. own. Um, yes. You know, let me ask you a question. So Jewish culture, Friday night, Shabbat dinner, Italian culture, mm-hmm. Sunday night gravy. For the Indian American big family meal. Yeah. What is it? When is it? Set the scene. What's on the stereo? Who's cooking? What's the vibe? Uh, um, it's honestly any meal, every meal, like Indian <laughs> culture revolves around, you know, like the di- the gathering, the dining table, you know, every holiday, every wedding, every celebration it doesn't it's not necessarily tied to a specific day of the week um Mm. but if there is a gathering there is so many dishes like without fail on the table you know it's not like a one pot meal culture for the most part um you know it's more more at least you know if anyone's even just swinging by for a a cup of chai my mom will have made you know at least four to six different snacks you know that are like or being pulled out of the freezer or like something you know even now like even if you stop by my apartment in los angeles i'm not as elaborate as my mom but like if you swing by like i will offer you at least three to five beverages you know and a couple of snacks that will be like fresh fruit on the table maybe some chips like popcorn you know like whatever i can kind of like whip up together yeah, yeah, yeah. Hospitality, yeah hospitality and like hospitality centered around food is like so central to Indian culture and the Indian identity. I mean, there is like a a saying in in Hindi and Gujarati in particular that basically translates to like the guest is God. And so, you know, if you're a guest in an Indian household, mm. like they want to make sure that you are incredibly comfortable, that you have anything that you might need. Um, yeah, without fail, no matter no matter you know if you're just swinging by to say hi or you're coming over for a full meal. Yeah. I love that. I mean, it goes to a lot of people. If food's at the center of your culture, then the guest is always got. The guest is like, yeah. <laughs> I'm embarrassed that I cannot serve you more. Um, yeah. Now, taking this outside of the home, what I found really interesting in the book is obviously, you know, there's so many different regions in India. Mm-hmm. Um, and much like China, those who immigrated first from these regions sort of set in mind, like to Americans, what that food is. Despite it being mm-hmm. so different from anywhere, spices, marinades, meats, you know, yeah. whatever, even traditions, um, to the point where I didn't even think about it. And, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I, I you know, but... You write about um, how the the timing of immigration really set the stage for the different restaurants that we're used to. Can you explain a little bit about that and how that's evolved over the years? Have have you seen 
its shift out of like the Punjabi of the 80s into something mm-hmm. a little bit more varied? Yeah. So, you know, a, l- a large swath of Indian immigration was from a handful of regions in India, you know, Punjab being one of them, which is in the north, which is where a lot of do- predominantly a lot of the restaurant food is sort of coming from um, that you see. I mean, obviously, you're not seeing a lot of Punjabi home cooking, which is also delicious and amazing. And I wish would be more, you know, more widely mm. available on the menus. Um, that Gujarat is like a very big uh, region that people are coming from as well. And then, you know, in South India, especially a lot of the tech workers, they're coming from Tamil Nadu and Telangana, you know, like states like that. So they're bringing, you know, food ways from those regions as well. So that's why, you know, you'll see like the dosas, you know, idlis like on, you know, some of the more South Indian restaurants, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, now, you know, I feel like in the last 10 years in particular, it's actually been a way more diverse set of immigration, you know, into from so many different regions in India. Um, so you're seeing like a Kashmiri community, you're seeing a Goan community, mm-hmm. a Kerala community, you know, or like, you know, people from Andhra Pradesh and Hyderabad and like, you know, all these places. And like, especially if you look in like the Bay Area and like things like that, where there's like really intense, oh, yeah. you know, South Asian populations, like you're getting hyper regional restaurants, like things that people are not even writing about because people haven't even heard of it unless you're from that community. And But it's like, they're, they're so busy serving the people of that community that it almost doesn't matter, you know? Like, it's a forest bias, and, like, they're thriving. It's kind of incredible, yeah. One of the best meals I've ever had was uh, this at-home business. This woman, she was she did Tiffin, in, like, about Amazing. an hour south of San Diego, vegan, okay. and it was just for all the tech workers around there. And it was your classic delivery service, pick up, drop off, things yeah. like that. And yeah. I was like, I, I would be vegan if I could eat this way. If I could <laughs> just eat this way, I would never touch another piece of meat. Um, but, you know, you have seen on the flip side of that, the small regional stuff, mm-hmm. some of the restaurants hit pop culture. Like the last time yeah. I was in New York, I was at the Rowdy Rooster and I got uh-huh. the Indian fried chicken. And yeah. I was smart enough to know like level one <laughs> with, my deli- with my delicate nature of it. But – you know, you are seeing the same thing where you're getting this postmodern application of Indian American food, obviously in more, you know, metropolitan areas. Um, yeah. Which even takes the food from beyond, you know, the, our generation to like a new generation of, you know, the, yeah. the, you know, Generation Z and things like that. What sort of freedom do you think this allows for Indian food? What sort of future do you see? coming with things like your book and these new types of restaurants and and becoming more mainstream. Yeah. I mean, I'm hoping it just means like further evolution and understanding Mm -hmm. and celebration of like flavors in Indian food and Indian cuisine. You know, there's like so much left to be like understood and talked about, but yeah, I think about restaurants like pizza palace, right. In LA, like shout out out to pizza palace. Yeah, shout out to Avish. Like, I love that shout he just like went Avish. for it, like opened this restaurant called Pija Palace, which is how like immigrant parents say pizza, um, you know, in a former foot clinic in Silver Lake. Like everything about it is so wild when you talk about it, like an Indian sports bar that serves Indian pizza and pasta in Silver Lake. Yeah. In the old Happy Foot, Sad Foot location. Yeah, but that's, yeah, I mean, exactly. that, that speaks a lot to the exciting nature of LA. Like that is, that is a restaurant that probably could only open in Los Angeles with lines out the doors. I don't know. I feel like it would thrive in New York. I feel like it would thrive in Texas. I think like there is an appetite for it. Um, And I think actually the Indian community is a little bit behind when it comes to um, encouraging people to open these types of businesses. You know, I think there's still Mm. historic kind of fighting up against this expectation of you know stability etc we're like going into you know what is considered white collar or sorry blue collar work or you know kind of less traditional pathways it's still not as encouraged as you know it, I would hope you know uh, I think it's like starting to change obviously you know and we're starting to see shifts in that but um you know, we need more, more pizza palaces, you know, kind of opening up around the country. Yeah. <laughs> well, your book is doing a lot of that good work, too. Uh, if people want to get the book or want to see where you're doing events or 
follow along with your adventures? Where can they go? How can they follow along? Yeah, the book is available anywhere. Books are sort of sold wherever you like to go. Amazon.com. Do you want to spell it? Uh, it's called Amrikan, A-M-R-I-K-A-N. So you can find it at all of the great indie bookstores too. If you want a signed copy now serving in Los Angeles, has like a stack Love of them. signed Shout copies. Out. Yeah, they're the best, like truly the best. Um, you can also find, you know, where I'm where I'm hanging out um, up front of my website, which is just kushbusha.com. That's K-H-U-S-H-B-U-S-H-A-H.com. I have all my tour dates like listed there. I'm doing like a part two of this tour in the fall, you know, hitting like the south, hitting Pacific Northwest, getting to some like other cities. I'm doing a full like Indian pizza party book tour, actually, because I have a whole Indian pizza chapter in the book. Um, so that's been like really fun. And then, yeah, you can also find me on Instagram um, at Kush and OJ, K-H-U-S-H-A-N-D-O-J. Used to be Smoke That Kush, but then I wanted a job. So had to change. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew the social media? Yeah, we've all been burned more ways than one. Well, maybe, uh, we'll maybe we should go back to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, congratulations. Shout out to Ava and Ellie and everyone at Mona for helping to set this They're up. The They're the best. We have another song from the archives and then a live performance here on Snacky Tunes on HRN. Whether you're a chef or just love going to restaurants, you know the best ingredients are everything, especially when it comes to beef. In Northern Australia, there's a different approach to raising high-quality beef. Westholm, based in Queensland and Northern Territory, is working with the land to create nature-led Australian Wagyu. Westholm stewards 16 million acres of rangeland, guided by their natural ecosystems. They're led by a belief that if they balance the needs of their cattle with the needs of the environment, Both can thrive. 
Westholm's team of rangeland experts and nature managers use a variety of tools to monitor and respond to the welfare of the environment, like satellites that address grass health and on-the-ground research. Cattle are happier when they have the freedom to forage and explore, so Westholm ensures that they can roam wild, foraging at will for the first two to three years of their lives. Their cows graze on native grasses like Mitchell grass, which is only found in Australia, along with dozens of other plants, herbs, and seasonal legumes. The result is a high-quality Wagyu beef that reflects the terroir of northern Australia and a flavor suited to complement any cuisine. Westholm believes that when nature leads, flavor follows. Learn more at westholm.com. Annie, welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think you are the first person that I have ever had on the show that's built their own instrument. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Um, I want to, I would love to know how that came about. Sure. But first off, like what instruments were you playing that just weren't doing it for you? Well, um, I have a, a classical background in violin and piano, and then I started songwriting on the viola and many of my early, you know, earlier stuff was done on the viola, bowing, singing, plucking. And then I started to want it to have more of a role of like an electric guitar. Mm -hmm. And so that came along like a lot of tedious complications came along with trying to turn it into an electric guitar so um turning the viola into yeah oh. like i had like zip ties and like humbucker pickups like glued onto it and it would always feed back and it would always go out of tune um Did but, you, do you feel like you maybe push like the, the viola like more than almost anyone i i don't know more than anyone but definitely like there were there were other string players who I would encounter who would feel like maybe uncomfortable or angry that I was like defacing my int instrument in some way or, um, did you but, like, were they, did you think it was like sac, did they think it was sacrilege? Some, yeah, sacrilege is probably, um, a word that they use behind my back, yeah. but, um, <laughs> I, um, did you find any other, did you find a support group at all? Like instrument hackers? Certainly. Yeah. There yeah. are definitely like plenty of string players who are also very open to yeah. this idea. And I understand the institution of the, of the strings being delicate too, but, um, then I kind of was frustrated with the viola for a couple of years. I tried to get it to do what I wanted to do. And eventually I started talking with my friend Thor Harris and, he um, he had been building some elect of, of these these club looking stick things with viola strings on them for Swans, mm -hmm. um, the band that he's playing in, and um, he said I can try and build you some, and we can experiment, and it ended up being quite simple and kind of seamless the way that. Before we get to the instrument, what mm -hmm. was like ultimately the thing that the viola just like didn't do for you? Where where did it just fall short? I think where it fell short was that I the f I didn't want to use it as a melodic instrument like mm -hmm. bowing it. I wanted the function to be more like a guitar, and so it's like trying to push a, s a circle into a square. It just doesn't quite want to. It just doesn't have that ease. So basically, I. I took the things from the viola that were really important to me and what I wanted to do and made this more accommodating to strumming and like, and what elements did you bring over? Um, well, the shape is clearly gone. It's just like a, a tree branch. Um, the thing that stayed was basically the dimensions of the instrument and mm -hmm. the actual strings, uh, the viola strings. Um, that's really about it. Uh, and that it's fretless. Um, and it and how did you come up with the name Electric Stick? Um, I was holding <laughs> I mean, it's it. It's pretty literal, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. For now, I, I I feel like there's something kind of so utilitarian and simple about it that um, the first thing that came to mind was the electric stick, and it felt <laughs> it felt appropriate. And um, does the wood, like the nature of the wood, I mean, both instruments use it, like change the sound, or how does it change the sound? That's a great question. I mean, I guess Thor and I are still kind of experimenting. This is the second of three that we've made and probably the the best for me um playing wise and this is made of a certain kind of wood called crate myrtle and then we have others that are made out of different wood and it does sound really different this is like probably the warmest sounding one um but of course it's just solid wood it's not like hollow inside so it doesn't matter as much as like a regular viola wood but uh do you know what the coldest wood would be <laughs> um <laughs> I don't know. Maybe um, a palm tree. I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, 
well, it's interesting because they talk about like violins and violas, like it takes time to warm up the instrument and to, like, to really kind of bring it to life. Yeah. Do you feel the electric stick is like the same way or do you think different properties are associated with it? In a lot of ways, I think it bypasses that whole process because it's so much about the the way that it's picking up the sound through the electric pickup. Um, and so much of the aging process of violas is about the resonance and the space in the instrument. Mm that allows it to be acoustic and change over time. Chances are like, what's going to affect this more is the amp that I'm plugging it into and not necessarily the, the wood will like factor in, but it's more, I guess what the amplifier is more of what's speaking to the ear instead of the actual instrument. Okay. Can we hear a song? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, what's the name of the first song you're going to play? Um, it's called wild west. And um, this is a new song. I haven't um, put it on an album yet. Um, do you need it or me? Okay. Oh, when it 
you've been working on building this instrument for or playing with a year and a half. What are some of the um, lessons that you've learned in, in building it? Um, or you and Thor, I guess. Sure. Thor definitely is, is, is the man behind all the technical stuff with the instrument. But uh, I guess what I've learned is that um, the instrument that I'm playing with and, and the range and the resonance of this of the sound can kind of open up my ideas about melody and the way I sing. My voice kind of follows the instrument in a way or kind of matches the the timbre of the instrument, and I've been pretty inspired by that part of it. That's interesting. So, like, originally you were trying to make songs on a, on a viola that wouldn't let you push, and now you have this new instrument, and now the instrument, you would say, is pushing you? Yeah, that's kind of, yeah, that's a, actually a great way to put it. There's there's just kind of a sense of ease. There's not all this stuff in front of me that I have to overcome before I can actually just make the music. So, so like, what um, what type of melodies or what type of ideas is this inspiring in you? Um, it's a combination of things. Definitely, it's... Um, if you, since you can't see it, for those of you, um, it's it's kind of rustic looking, um, and it kind of conjures a lot of um, kind of raw, out, outdoorsy kind of um, Wild West themes. That was kind of one of the first songs I wrote on it. Um, but also just like simplicity and minimalism kind of, it's brought a lot of that to how I'm working through things. How does your, I mean, you have a few records that you've already written. Are, are they translatable onto the instrument or is it all new work? Uh, they ser- Yeah, they definitely are. Um, I'm actually, I will play a song from my last record where the viola um, was actually playing what I'm going to play on the instrument. Um, but a lot of my live set that I'm playing, which by the way, I have a show tonight at the Manhattan Inn. Oh, okay. Um, oh, great. Right, right um, by where I live. Yeah, cool. Yeah, okay. I also live over there. Um it uh, a lot of the set is like half stuff, old stuff that I've translated onto the new instrument, and half new stuff kind of thing. Has there been like an uproar from your fans that you've moved away from the viola? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't really know. I guess, um, I guess I still have more, more. I need more time and space to kind of express what's going on. But I, it is a viola essentially. I mean, it it, it definitely is still a viola, but. Um, I guess I'm more into expressing ideas as a songwriter and a lyricist and a singer than I guess I view this more as like a vehicle for songwriting now, as opposed to like, I'm a violist and I, I understand. You know? oh, interesting. So this has also somewhat changed your like self identity uh, as a musician. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's part of a process that's been happening not to feel so tied to what the, what the music is made with just kind of, letting it happen with whatever's kind of in front of me and trying to make it I get, yeah, just not so much about the objects involved with making the music. Okay. Um, why don't we hear another song? Okay. Uh, what's this one? This is called crushing limbs and this uh, is off my last record. Um, heavy meadow. Um, I need to just tune really quick. That's the no thing problem. with this, the guy that it can be kind of finicky. Does it not hold the tune as much or, um, it does relatively well, but they, I, I move tunings around quite often. Okay.
Some of your previous records, you've worked with Steve Albini. Mm-hmm. Um, what was that experience like and what kind of lessons? Because he's obviously known for teaching lots of lessons. Uh-huh. Uh, what lessons did he impart on you? Honestly, um, whenever I think about the time that I spent working with him, I just saw him as a person who was um, very, very good and efficient at what he does. <laughs> I know it sounds clinical, but he really actually just has... Um, a really important skill set for a lot of a lot of musicians. It's hard to find engineers that you that you really believe can document what you need to do. Eric here is actually another uh, example of a great engineer who's going to record my record. Um, Eric's on drums for those of you who can't see. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I guess I learned from Steve too that you, as musicians, we to to kind of transmit what we need to do. We need people who have those skill sets. It's really important and. Um, and they're kind of, I hate to say it, but they're kind of dying out. There just isn't, there's, there isn't the same amount of money and resources in the industry to keep those people around. So Steve taught me a lesson of, we need other people to make, make what we want to make. I want to follow up on the, the dying out thing, but mm-hmm. like, what are the skills that you feel that he had? Like, what are some of the more tangible ones um, that he brought to the table? Just, uh, for one thing, like he, the dilemma that I had that time I was playing the viola and I was singing and we, I needed to perform it live. So basically you have two really important elements that can't be separated. And he just dealt with that limitation really well. And Mike, the room, he put like, I don't know. He just, the way that he Mike, the room was very creative and he kind of problem solved this thing that I could never quite get around, which, um, and which records did you do with him? Um, Rockwell. Okay. Um, Really good, really good drum sounds. Um, excellent drum sounds. Um, also just pretty laid back and easy to work with. Um, and <laughs> and why do you feel like people like him are, are dying out? Because, I mean, there's this argument that, like, it's never been easier to, like, set up your own studio and do everything in your house. Sure. So the barrier to entry is low, but... I think... I think um, Certainly there's been like a ton of accessibility to be able to record your own music, but, um, and that, that's helpful in a lot of ways, but there, there are definitely, there is definitely, um, a very, a very deep and nuanced skill to recording music that only gets passed on to people, um, through, through generations of music making. And as you know, I'm sure there's not really much music left in the, in the music industry. I mean, there's some floating around, but, um, I just think because there's, like I said, less and less resource, there's, there's, there's less money for people to actually make a living at being an engineer. And right. so it's, it's a dying art and it's an incredibly, um, it takes a lot of skill and a lot of knowledge and experience to actually get to where Steve Albini or, or Eric has, has, has gotten, um, so the next record, uh, recording early next year, uh-huh. all, uh, new songs built for the electric stick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's, and where are you recording? Um, at the magic shop, 
uh, in, in Soho. Awesome. And then that will be like a new record next year? Yes. Oh, mm-hmm. great. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you said you're playing a show tonight? I'm playing a show tonight at the Manhattan Inn. Um, I love that place. Yeah. Actually, it'll be a trio, Eric, and a, a bass player who's not able to make it today. Okay. Um, um, well, we want to make sure we have time for uh, one more song. Sure. Um, but where can people find your earlier records, um, get in touch with you, Yeah. see photos of the instruments? Um, well, you can find me on Twitter, Annie uh, underscore Rossi. I'm actually, I'm I'm really bad at the internet. I that's fine. That's like a running, stuff. that's a running theme in today's show. Okay. Yeah. Um, my website's under construction. Um, but Facebook, um, I just imagine having like that old school, like hazard tape, like from like the nineties, yeah. like under construction, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like my under constraint, under construction page is under construction. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, I have records on iTunes and, and, um, also, there's a label called Three Syllables that has Heavy Meadow for sale as well. Oh, amazing. Um, One last question. Sure. Um, have any fans started sending you pieces of wood yet? Pieces of wood? Yeah. No, that's really cool, though. Uh, I would I would be I'd be open to that. Yeah. I mean, you could potentially put a call and like an international call because, I mean, that wood is not a, it's not a big piece. Yeah. So you could potentially put out like an international call for like two by four ish yeah. size wood. OK. To see if Thor could transform that. Yeah. I might have to steal your, steal your idea. Here. You can just take it. Okay. You're not, you're not that. I, I guess what, I'm never going to have use for that. Okay. Thank um, you. so I want to thank Sid and Homer for coming on and congratulations again to 10 years of Roving Tea Room. Shout out to Darren and Anna. Uh, shout out to my family. Uh, it's been a wild fucking year. That's all I can say. Shout out to my girlfriend who I adore. And, uh, I hope everyone has a good holiday and is safe and, uh, you know, returns well we'll turn next year for the beginning of year seven of snacky tunes so oh, awesome. you're gonna play the last song of this year no way yeah so 2015 any message you want to impart onto guest listeners family friends doesn't be a shout out could be cryptic could, um could be a word could be a feeling i don't know just uh enjoy listening I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's actually that's actually perfect. Okay. Well done. Um, what is the name of the last song? Uh, it's called Get Me Working. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for listening, um, and uh, we'll see you in a few weeks. Thanks to Liz, Jack, Aaron, Patrick, Heritage, the whole Heritage family. Uh, bye. <laughs>
talk about food. We talk about music with musical dudes. Finger on the pulse, snacky tunes. Snacky tunes is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.